Welcome to the Data Science Institute's virtual seminar series. My name is Dr. Sarah Mackey from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Here at Lawrence Livermore, data science has become an essential discipline in many of our key program areas. LLNL is home to many challenging data sets, as well as home to some of the world's most advanced supercomputers. Our data science staff work in a variety of areas, including machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, statistical inference, predictive modeling, and uncertainty quantification. The Data Science Institute acts as a central hub for our lab's data science activities. We host events like this seminar series in order to introduce new ideas and potential collaborations to our laboratory staff. We invite speakers from outside the laboratory, from the Bay Area and beyond, to share their innovative approaches with our data science community. We are pleased now to include a wider audience in our seminar series through these recordings. You can read about past speakers at our website at data-science.llnl.gov or you can email us at datascience at llnl.gov. Thank you and enjoy the seminar series. Now ready to introduce our speaker. Alex Kloniger. Alex is an associate professor in the Department of Mathematical Sciences at the Holly G. Alou Data Science Institute at the University of California, San Diego. He received his PhD in Applied Mathematics and Scientific Computation from the University of Maryland in 2014. And then he was an NSF postdoc and a Gibbs Assistant Professor of Mathematics at Yale until 2017. And at that time, he then joined US, uh, UCSD. Um, Alex researches problems in the area of geometric data analysis and applied harmonic analysis. His, uh, he focuses on approaches that model data as being locally lower dimensional, including data concentrated near manifolds or subspaces. These types of problems arise in a number of scientific disciplines, including imaging and medicine. The techniques developed relate to many machine learning and statistical algorithms, including deep learning, network analysis, and measuring distances between probability distributions. So Alex is here to talk to us today about networks that adapt to and beyond the intrinsic dimensionality of the domain. Um, Alex, when you're ready, go ahead and uh, begin. Awesome. <clears throat> hi. So, uh, yeah, hi, I'm Alex. Um, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And um, yeah, I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about some background of some work I've been doing recently. And um, you know, just generally, if you have any questions, let me know. And more importantly, if you're interested and want to learn more, talk more about it, look at potential venues of, you know, applications and stuff, let me know. Hit me up. Um, I would I would love to talk further. Um, yeah, so um, as Sarah said, I'm in the math department and also in the Data Science Institute. I'll just give a quick plug to the Data Science Institute. We have a new uh, graduate cohort that we're just starting. So in a few years, you'll start seeing some people with Masters and PhDs in data science from UCSD, and I hope you'll, you know, reflect back on this and look favorably on them. So, um, yeah. So um, I'll give a whoop, hold on, quick, yeah, shout out to some collaborators. So this is joint work with uh, Timo, who is a postdoc that I work with. Shu is a colleague of mine at, at Duke. Stefan is a postdoc at Davis. Ramji is a professor at RPI. Uh, Emily is a professor at CSU. And in particular, I want to note uh, Scott Mahan, who's my student at UCSD and is actually going to be graduating this year. Uh, he's worked on a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about here. And also, he's particularly interested in actually uh, finding a position in a national lab. So um, if this is of interest and you want to chat more with Scott or something, um, you know, that'd be great. So um, yeah, without further ado. Uh, so. I'm going to be talking today about uh, deep learning and kind of about what happens when your data could be modeled in some lower dimensional structure than maybe the ambient space that your data lives in. Uh, so this is a few projects that I'll touch on. Um, but uh, before I do that, I just want to kind of give a brief overview of what I'm saying when I talk about deep learning, what I'm saying when I you know, talk about approximation and stuff like this. Uh, so this slide is maybe... Um, unneeded at this point. I feel a lot of people have seen this, but basically it, you know, if you've ever thought about neural networks or thought about why they're so useful or how everybody, you know, thinks that they are the greatest thing in the world. Um, a lot of times the reason is because they're highly adaptable and expressive and able to learn, uh, you know, very complex functions if you have enough data and train in the correct way. 
Um, and so one of the things that people have been really interested in is trying to address the question of basically how large does your network have to be to learn certain classes of functions, right? You know, can I, can I have a two layer one node neural network that's going to be able to do this? Or am I going to need something that's computationally completely intractable in order to solve a super, super simple problem like linear regression, right? Um, that's really the central questions that uh, a lot of people are interested in in sort of the intersection of math and neural, ne neural networks. Um, so a lot of times the way that people think about neural networks is from this, this perspective that's called a sort of approximation theory, and I'll, I'll go into a couple of highlights of that in a minute. But a lot of times, you know, when, when people think about uh, how complex does a neural network have to be, they're thinking about, you know, how many points do they need to learn, how big does the size how big is the size of uh, the network? How is the dimensionality of the data affect the size of the network? That's a really fundamental question. Um, yeah, uh, and, and there's a lot of gaps, basically, is kind of what I want to just mention here. Um, so what am I going to focus on today? So I'm going to focus on several topics that I've been working on in the last couple of years with these colleagues. Um, and, and what I really want to show at the end of the day is that it turns out that the functions you're trying to learn and the complexity of the functions you're trying to learn is just as critical as the complexity of the data that you're feeding in. And there's kind of a trade-off that you can get between these two. Um, I also want to sort of talk about how you can build networks in practice that will explicitly use knowledge of the fact that your data lies in some lower dimensional surface, you know, some dimension reduced form. Um, and, and also, I want to talk a little bit about a potential application, which is actually even using very small neural networks to build two sample test statistics, which I'll, I'll kind of get into at the end. Um, okay, so neural networks, what am I talking about? <laughs> um, so if you've never seen a neural network before, the easiest way to characterize just what's called a simple feed forward neural network is to think of you feed in data that lives in some dimension. And you're applying a series of affine transformations and an affine transformation is just, you know, some set of weight vectors and some bias. And then you're applying this little nonlinearity. And when you apply the nonlinearity, it turns a linear problem into a nonlinear problem. And you do this several times, and then you get some output phi, right? And at the end of the day, the question we're trying to address is given some finite data set, can we estimate whatever the generating function was of y given the inputs of x? Right? And we're going to do that by tuning these ALs and BLs and trying to sort of tune our weights to find a particular network that really fits well for our problem. Um, and this is generally done by talking about, you know, stochastic gradient descent or, you know, atom or whatever optimization method you want, where you're optimizing, say, a least squares loss, right? How well does my model fit the data in squared norm? You could have a logistic loss. You could have, you know, fill in your favorite loss. Um, so I want to kind of, well, actually, before I go to the next slide, I want to mention um, there's a real kind of, I'm kind of burying the lead here when I describe things in this very simple way. And that is, what do these A's and these B's potentially look like, right? So maybe my data is in two dimensions, right? Very, you know, I'm just trying to model some 2D function. Well, it would be a problem if I needed this first weights matrix to be, you know, 1 billion by 2 to generate, you know, to take a two-dimensional problem, and turn it into a billion dimensions, and then another billion dimensions, and then maybe eventually push it back down to one dimension, and that that would be like the only way I could learn a function. That would be really bad. It's bad because it's not stable. It's bad because it's computationally intensive, and it's bad because the number of points you're going to need in order to accurately learn those parameters is just, it's the size of the known universe, right? There's no way you'd actually be able to attack that problem. Okay, so what I want to give you before we get into to some recent work is just kind of a survey of how you can think about this problem um, in terms of like how bad is how bad is the potential, you know, upper bound of, of, of how big these networks have to be in order to learn certain functions. Okay, um, so I'm just going to kind of go through a couple of quick results to kind of describe, um, um, you know, what 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 can be said, right? So um, the first is this famous result by Yarotsky that came out about five years ago. Oh, sorry, I realized I forgot to mention one of the particular nonlinearities a lot of people are interested in is this thing called a rectified linear unit. It's this sigma right here. Effectively, all it means is if you get a negative number, just set it to zero. If you get a positive number, just keep it positive, right? 
And it's a very simple thing. It works very well in practice. Everyone loves rectified linear units because they create nice back propagation gradients and all of that. I, I won't go into the details of that at the moment, but just to say that's kind of a very sort of baseline activation unit that's mostly used in practice. And so that's kind of the theory that we want to talk about here. Uh, okay, so what did Yurovsky say? So he was saying, well, you know, say we had some function and the function had some number of derivatives and it's a function from some d-dimensional cube and outputs, you know, a real value, let's just say. Well, how complicated would my network have to be in order to actually learn that function? Well, what he proved, and this is actually, you can show that this is optimal under this assumption, um, is that if you want to learn this thing in some L infinity norm, you know, point wise, you're close to within our epsilon, then the depth of the network you need, and depth is basically the number of affine transformations you use, it scales like log one over epsilon. That's not bad, right? Here's the problem. The width of the network, how many nodes do you need in order to actually be able to learn any potential function in that class? It actually scales with this epsilon to the minus dimension, capital D. Now, that might not seem brutal, but let's let's pick an example here. <laughs> what if you're just trying to train a neural network to learn something like MNIST digits, right? Simple problem, trying to learn some images. MNIST is actually made up of 784 pixels. So what that means is, if I want to get to within, let's say, error one tenth, which like is not that great, I would need 10 to the 784 parameters. I would need my width, actually more than that. I would need the width of each layer to be 10 to the 784. That is undoable, right? And this is actually the sort of called, this is referred to as the curse of dimensionality. Right. If you're truly in this ambient dimensional space, you're you're out of luck. There's no way you can learn that function. You don't have enough points. You don't have enough computational power. It's just not going to happen. Okay. Um, so that's kind of one result that exists. And I, I'll also just kind of mention another result, which maybe you might think ameliorates this problem, but it really doesn't. <laughs> um, and again, this is just a survey of some things that happened before. So around the same time, I proved some stuff. Uh, there's a couple other people that proved some stuff around that time. <laughs> where we said the following, let's say your data lied perfectly, just exactly on some k-dimensional smooth manifold in a high dimensional space, okay? So if you've never seen a manifold before, basically what it means is it's a lower dimensional surface that has lower intrinsic dimension. And, uh, you know, if you look at you know, coordinate systems, they're like twice differentiable or something like that, right? So, so it's, it's a very smooth system. You know, you can think of like a, you know, a circle as a 1D manifold in 2D, right? Uh, so, so if your data lies really nicely on this surface, exactly on this surface, then it winds up, you can actually build a network that will be able to approximate to within our epsilon, but with a width that actually didn't depend on the ambient dimension. It depends on the intrinsic dimension. And what the intrinsic dimension is, is basically how many free parameters did I have in my data, right? I could be in a 10 dimensional manifold in a thousand dimensions, and this dimension would just be 10, right? This K be 10. So the idea here is if your data like truly lies on a manifold, and that's exactly where you're working, and that's the only place your data is, and the function is nice and all this, you can kind of, do a little better. You don't suffer from this crazy ambient dimension. You just suffer from the intrinsic dimension. Okay. Uh, and by the way, I should say this is not special to deep learning. There's a billion machine learning algorithms where you can prove basically the same thing. Um, it's actually just a little trickier to prove it for neural networks, but it can be done. Uh, so, so that's kind of where we were at with talking about, you know, the size of networks up until a couple years ago. Um, now, I, I want to make one comment, um, and, and this is maybe just as a brief aside, so forgive me this for one moment, because I do think it's kind of an interesting point. A lot of people think about this problem of, well, it's kind of weird to say, if I want to learn something within Air Epsilon, I need to grow the size of my network to a particular size. And then if I wanted to do better, I would need to grow my network even more. It's kind of not how we really work in practice. How we really work in practice, if you're training a neural network, is you fix the architecture ahead of time, and then you just go. 
right? So this is actually a really interesting perspective. It's an alternative perspective to what I was just describing, which is what if we fix the size of our network ahead of time and try to talk about what we can learn? Well, it winds up that that also has a problem. Uh, and that problem I would actually consider to be even bigger. So there's this famous paper that was written a couple of years ago by Philip Peterson, who's a friend of mine and a couple of other people, basically saying if we're on this bounded domain, we have these you know, activation units that are differentiable, but not analytic, or even if they are analytic, blah, blah, blah. It winds up that what happens is the set of neural networks of a fixed size is actually not even a closed set in LP space. So, so what I mean by that is if I'm trying to approximate a function in LP, in, you know, some LP function, L2 function or whatever, I'm, I'm generating a sequence of functions, right? At every step in training, I'm generating a new neural network. Um, the set of, you know, so I'm generating a sequence. It winds up that I'm going to want, I'm, I, it's very possible to converge to a point that actually was not a neural network. Right, so, so you can run into this situation where you train a sequence of neural networks to learn a function that can't be expressed as a neural network. It's kind of weird. Um, and, and that would be if you were trying to do this for convergence in, in LP space, right? Convergence in L2, let's say. Uh, so that's kind of a negative result, right? And uh, there's this fun little conjecture in here where they said, we actually think that in Sobolev convergence, you'd be able to show this. So if you show that your neural network, you know, is approximating your function in, in it in the function in its first you know however many derivatives then you know whatever you're converging to could be expressed as a fixed size neural network uh so so my students scott and emily and i actually want to prove in the following year that that's that's not true either um you know even if you're trying to you know approximate in any sobolev class this set is not even closed the set of fixed size neural networks is not closed um and 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 what that means is that your weights are necessarily blowing up to infinity. So there's very nice functions you might want to approximate with a neural network, but if you try to approximate it with a fixed size neural network, the weights are going to blow up to infinity. It's like kind of it's a negative result, but it's to motivate the fact that that um, thinking about allowing your network to kind of vary in size a little bit is actually not the weirdest thing in the world. It's actually important. So that's that's a little bit of a side, and that's kind of the extent of what I'll say about a fixed size neural network. Um, but now what I want to get into is actually talking about some theory. Uh, so how do we move past this weird cursed dimensionality problem I was describing? So what I want to talk about is a couple different models of functions that we can think about where where we'll really be able to say something quite nice. So so what's the main question that I want to address in this first paper uh, or this first part of my talk, which was a paper that I wrote with uh, Timo Clock? So the question is, basically, can we approximate functions with the neural network where our network complexity goes beyond the intrinsic dimension of our data? So it's a pretty simple question, right? Um, and, and uh, you know, mathematically, if I'm trying to pose it, what we're saying is we have some finite number of points, intrinsic dimension D data. I want to get something where the convergence rate is actually going to be even better than that. It's not easy, uh, but there's actually a way around it. And, and this was kind of a novel insight that was brought by, uh, by, by Timo, where he said, you know, we're always thinking about the problem in terms of how complicated the data is and trying to learn every possible function on that data. But a lot of times we don't need to learn every possible function on that data. We need to learn one, two, three functions, right? It's a very simple class of functions on that data. So what if instead of thinking about the complexity of the data we're feeding in, we thought about the complexity of the function that we're getting out or the function we're trying to learn, okay? And, and here's a way that we kind of talked about that. So we define what I'm gonna call basically a function that's invariant to off-dimensional, uh, off-manifold, directions, okay? And, and how we can define that is as follows. Say there is some low dimensional structure. Now this is not, this is not where my data is. My data could be everywhere. My data could be on the unit cube and R million, whatever. But say there is some nice little sort of low dimensional structure and that we can say the following about our function. I assume that my function 
really only depends on the projection of my point onto this manifold and then whatever value I get there or, you know, whatever function I have there. So, you know, uh, if you think about it this way, say my data is like some near manifold data, you know, like these, these gray points up here, you see there is this low dimensional structure, even though my data isn't actually low dimensional. And what we're assuming here is that really, basically we're allowing ourselves to say that everything in that normal direction is just kind of noise. I don't care about it. What I care about is what's going on as I move along this manifold, okay? Um, and, and so what you can do is you can think about projecting your data onto this and then modeling some function here. Okay. You know, you can think about that in like the Swiss roll or something too. You know, you, Swiss roll is a two-dimensional object in 3D. Maybe the function only depended on the angle. So then it's like a 1D thing in 3D, right? Um, so this is kind of a fun, different perspective of, of, of trying to learn functions. It's actually very much related if you're familiar with this idea of what's called a single index model or a multi-index model. The idea is that your data could be everywhere, but the functions you care about really only depend on projecting onto some subspace, low dimensional surface, something like that. Okay, and it, and it actually is the model of a lot of potential functions. Um, so, you know, what, it, what are reasons that we care about this model, right? So one reason is that this actually allows us to move to what in the sort of manifold learning community has been considered a, well, I don't wanna say a white whale, but like, a, you know, a significant question, which is what does it mean to be near a low dimensional manifold, right? So if you lie perfectly on some low dimensional surface, you're great. You know, you have data that lies perfectly on the circle. Great, it's a 1D thing. What if you have data that's just like around it? Well, that's a little different because now your data really is high dimensional, but its behavior is somehow characterized by a low dimensional surface. How do you mathematically talk about that? Well, I like talking about it in this way. And there are a lot of people that talk about it in a lot of different ways. If you're interested in the near manifold data, I'd refer you to the work of like Yareev Eisenbud, who does some really interesting work about projecting onto low dimensional subspaces for data that is near the subspace. Uh, but what I'm thinking about is, um, all right, well, first, again, I can define this, you know, projection onto a manifold. So I have, you know, some noisy sample and I can think about a clean sample, which is basically, you know, defined in the way you define projection. Well, what are we doing when we use this model for a function? What we're doing is we're saying, you know, I'm going to define data as being near a low dimensional manifold. If the functions I'm trying to learn don't care about the noise directions. So I've kind of moved out of the realm of geometry all of a sudden, right? We've said it's not about the data. It's about the functions you care about on that data. Which actually makes a lot of sense, right? Um, you know, if, if you had a function that varied wildly in some noisy direction, well, then it's not noise anymore. It's relevant, right? It's an important feature. So, so what we're doing is we're pushing all of that geometry and near manifold behavior onto the function. We're saying the function only cares about what happens when you project onto, the, onto this lower dimensional surface. Okay? And this is really the model we'll think about. Um, and, and this could show up in other examples as well. This could show up if you wanted to be invariant to certain directions. Maybe your data is space filling, but you know your low dimensional structure and all these like group actions that you could apply, you know you want to be invariant to them, right? Well, then what you could do is if you can define some projection, right? And I'm defining it in a very simple way of just, you know, closest point in L2. If you get into some group theory or something, you can define more interesting notions of what it means to project onto sort of your clean samples. Uh, but again, then you can write down functions of this form. Right, the functions we care about are functions that only depended on that lower dimensional surface. Okay, all right. So that's a huge model. It's an idea. This is some, you know, math BS. <laughs> what do we care? Right. What? Why? How does this help? Um. All right. So first off, what data can we describe? Okay. So I, unfortunately, I have to go into one quick technical moment. Um, this is really fun characterization on a manifold. It's called the reach of a manifold. So if you've never seen this before, what the reach is, is basically given some manifold, 
how far can I move away from the manifold such that there is a unique projection back onto the manifold? Okay, so on the circle, you can go as far as you want until you reach the origin. Because at the origin, there's no unique projection back onto the manifold, right? It's equidistant from a bunch of points on the manifold. So that's how we define the reach, okay? So this kind of modeling assumption we have is we're gonna assume that we have data that's say within some constant of the reach of the manifold. Now, depending on the manifold, this could actually allow us to have space filling data, you know, the unit cube in our capital D or something, right? So what we're saying is, how complicated our data can be is again a kind of a function of how complicated our function is. Okay. Um, and and with that, we can actually say something really nice. And I, I I recognize that this this theorem almost looks identical to the one I showed you from 2017. But there's a there's a small but absolutely critical difference here. We're no longer assuming our data lies on this nice manifold. We're just saying, you know, what if our function really only depended on a low dimensional sort of index? If that's the case, the complexity of the network we need only scales with that intrinsic dimension. Okay. So, you know, I can we can say some technical stuff about this. Uh, you know, asymptotically, this thing is similar to if I had assumed the data was directly on the manifold. There's this tiny, 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 tiny dependence on the ambient dimension, but it really isn't that bad. Uh, if we want to re go all the way to the edge of the reach of the manifold, this theorem kind of becomes vacuous, which is to be expected. Um, and I'll actually talk about this other connection uh, towards the end of my talk. But I really want to focus on what this means, okay? Um, so let's pick a very simple problem. Linear regression. Linear regression is not a hard problem, right? How can you think about linear regression? You have data in a high dimensional space and you project onto some 1D line. That 1D line being your, you know, line of, of how of you know parameters that allow your function to vary. Well, we know that linear regression is not, it doesn't suffer from the curse of dimensionality, right? You're really only depending on some one-dimensional line. Right, your function that you're trying to learn only depends on a one dimensional line. Your data could have been defined everywhere. Right? This theory says exactly that. This recovers that. You know, if you're trying to do linear regression with a neural network, you really don't need that many parameters. You don't need that, that complicated of a system. I, I realize that kind of sounds tautological in some sense, but you know, it, it's, a, it's sort of a nice sort of satisfying statement to know that you don't have to worry about bringing this, you know, huge weapon of a neural network to a little, you know, easy problem of, of linear regression. But beyond that, if you were trying to do nonlinear regression that only depended on the projection onto a line, you know, maybe you project onto the line, but then you have some highly complicated function there, not a linear function. Still, really easy problem to learn with a neural network. Okay. So that's part of the power here is that we're really saying the complexity of the function is what matters. And it recovers all of those other theories that I was describing uh, pretty nicely, actually, uh, and, and sharply. Um, now, again, I, I want to emphasize one point. I've been talking about approximation theory. What we're talking about here is basically, given the size of network, one could learn this. I'm not exactly talking about the optimization at this point. This is actually work that I'm doing currently. How do we prove the optimization actually attains those weights. Okay. Um, so anyways, um, that's, you know, one result. Uh, I, if you're interested, I'm going to kind of skip this actually now that I think about it, but um, if you're interested in understanding more of the kind of math, if you're interested in, you know, approximation theory, uh, uh, there's some novel stuff we do here related to basically creating partitions of unity of our manifold that extend really, really far in normal directions and are really, really small and in uh, directions along the manifold. And then we have this nice result that kind of says, actually, it's very, 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 very easy to learn those partitions of unity with a neural network, which is kind of surprising. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of skip past that. Uh, but what I do want to talk about is another version of this same problem. So this is from the same paper. It's basically equivalent results. But in the previous part, I was talking about regression. I wanted to regress a function. 
and I was approximating an L infinity. Now I want to talk about classification. Classification, a lot of times, is kind of a fundamentally different problem. Um, and, and the reason is that, you know, it's really just about living on one side of a subspace or, you know, living on one side of a decision boundary or another side of the decision boundary. Well, it winds up that a lot of the ways that we think about classification can actually boil, be boiled down into, again, this kind of way of talking about functions. Um, a lot of times people think about classification by saying, we're going to assign a, uh, like binary classification and below I have multi-label, but let's say we're just talking about binary classification. A lot of times what happens is you assign a label based on whether you are closer to some set of points that you know to be from your class one or some set of points that you know to be from your class two. That set of points could be your training data. That set of points could be some nice core set. It could be support vectors. There's a lot of different instances where problems boil down to, you know, all that matters is how far you are if you're closer to this data set or this other data set. Once you know that, you can easily assign a label. Well, it winds up that you can actually extend this to the multi-class problem, and you can think about functions of this type, which are basically functions that depend on the minimum distance to some set, and then you're summing over all of these. If you use indicator functions, you basically get standard classification. Okay. Um, so this is another sort of functional model that we'd want to talk about, and, and it winds up we can say almost the exact same result in this context. So the way to, to phrase it is the, the following, which is to say, um, okay, let's say we had some set of representative points of each of our classes. And those set of, rep of representative points are sort of, and I, I'm, I'm kind of saying morally k-dimensional. What I mean by that is they're kind of a, an epsilon or, well, I'm, I'm using delta here, so I don't use epsilon at the end. And they're kind of a delta net um, which means that if you want to decrease delta, you need to in, uh, you need to increase the number of points by delta to the minus k. Okay, so kind of in this example, I had one right here. You can kind of think about this as being, you know, one dimension, morally one dimensional. You can kind of see like, okay, this is really just kind of distance to a line, distance to a line, distance to a line. Um, so given this kind of classification region, again, we can wind up saying that if we want to learn our label. Now they really are labels to within error epsilon. You really only need something that scales with that intrinsic dimension. Um, so let's let's talk about what that means in a couple of contexts, right? Um, let's say you had data that was just clustered data, right? Clustered data meaning your data lies in some nice ball around a point. That's one label. Your data lies in some nice ball around a point. That's another label. That's actually a zero-dimensional problem. Right? It only depends on a point, one point, not, not, not points on the line, points on the surface, one point. How far are you from that one center? Right? Like a K means or something, you know, it only depends on how far you are away from the mean. That's a zero dimensional problem, which actually means that if you're trying to learn that with a neural network, the rates you need only depend on epsilon to the minus one. So, you know, that's about the best you can do. That's the best you could possibly hope for. Okay. And, you know, again, if your data really only depended on sort of its distance to some lines or, you know, you're, you're thinking of, of, of regions of cl classes as kind of being like cylinders or something, it's, it's a 1D problem. So because of that, you really only need, again, just epsilon to the minus one points or epsilon to the minus one size parameters. Okay. Um, so, you know, with this, you can generalize this to other metrics. It's, you know, I, I, I like the theory here. Um, I'm not claiming this is like the be all to end all of neural network theory. Uh, there's actually been people already that are starting to build extensions to this for other functional models. Um, I'll refer you to the work of Wenjing Liao, who does some really cool uh, work. She's at Georgia Tech. Um, but yeah, anyways. Oh, right. <laughs> I kind of forgot to mention. There's one other thing I should say here. And I'm, I, I've kind of buried this uh, because we didn't really do anything new here. Um, but it's just kind of a byproduct of what we're showing. If you know the number of parameters you need, then there's this nice statistical learning theory called uh, excess risk minimization that says you also basically know how many points you need 
in order to learn those parameters. Okay. Um, and what we wind up getting is because we know the size of the networks we need, that also tells us the uh, number of points we need in order to learn those parameters well. Okay. So what do we get? Well, if your data really lied on some, you know, in the ambient space, that's like the Yurotsky result. If your data actually lied on a low dimensional manifold, that's like the, the result that I had. Uh, from 2017. If your data lies near some manifold, that's what we're talking about now. Again, it's basically like you're on the manifold. And if your labels really only depend on how close your, how, you know, how close your representative points are, again, really just kind of depends on intrinsic dimensionality. Okay, and these are kind of the number of points that you would need. Um, so that's, you know, for this part of the talk, kind of where I'm going to end um because i just want to you know take it give a takeaway of this for a moment which is what are we trying to say we're, we're we're trying to say if the functions you care about are not too complicated and you can understand sort of the way in which they're not very complicated then your network does not have to be very complicated it's not, you don't need to build these crazy huge networks that can learn everything and overfit to everything. Okay. Um, yeah. And if you're really interested in, you know, learning data that, you know, lies on manifolds that, you know, lies near manifolds, this is the, you know, backbone theory that tells you how complicated your networks have to be. And, and, you know, as I said, I'm working now on the optimization side of this, and there's a lot of other directions that one can go. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, the, the beginning part, um, you know, I, I, I have some more that I can talk about, but I can, I can also pause for a second if anybody has any questions. I have a question. Yeah, what's up? Um, so as a step towards that optimization that you're working on, you presumably want for these uh, existence reserves of the number of parameters, along with that, you want something bounds on the weights that you need to have for these neural networks, right? Bounds like on so, the magnitude of the weights? Yeah. Yeah, on the magnitude of the weights, because if they are blowing up, then of course the optimization is not going to get you That's there. That's exactly right, yes. So do you have uh, partial results on, on, on that before you get to the oh, optimization? Great question. So in, in I, I did not say that, and actually we don't have this explicitly in the theorem, but I can tell you that in the constructions we're talking about here, the weights are bounded. So they like these can be done, these can be learned without the weights blowing up. Now, how does that tie into the optimization? That's a broader question. Um, I'll actually refer you to um, uh, a colleague of mine who has kind of the first step of merging the approximation side with the optimization side. Uh, his name's Mahdi Sultana Kanabi. He's at uh, USC. He has a recent paper called like Learning learning low dimensional dictionaries or something. Le no, learning with gradient descent. That's what it's called. And he shows that actually, as you very begin to train the weights, they actually kind of align to, if you have one subspace that dictates the entire problem, your weights kind of begin to align to that subspace. And that's what he uses. So we're building, you know, extensions to this and incorporating a lot of this, this work. Um, but yeah, no, the weights do not blow up in this case, again, provided that you're allowing your network to sort of not necessarily just be like a fixed 50 weight thing and you never change it. Right. So a uh, second question and then yeah. I don't want to take up all the questions. Uh, so often people design neural networks with uh, symmetries in the neural networks themselves, like, you know, convolutional networks or yes. transformers, or, I mean, you can, there's a whole set of things that one could consider. So what, what happens is that, can that be incorporated into your theory? Yes, yes. Uh, so that so right now we're just talking about projection onto sort of the clean data. So if that projection comes from, you know, something where you had explicitly built in an invariance, then then you've got it. Um, there's okay, also so you could re sorry, you're saying you could replace fully connected with con nets if that symmetry exists. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yep. And in fact, this has actually been done by um, uh, Sophie Langer and uh, uh, Johannes Schmidt Huber. 
um, who I think this year actually just put out a paper doing something very, very similar to that. That was specifically for convolutional networks. Okay. Um, the sort of general approximation with like any type of invariance you would want, there's not a fully satisfying sort of dimensionality analysis yet. There's some results by Tommy Poggio, um, and, but they're not, it's not, it would be nice to have a little bit more. <laughs> uh, there's also some work by uh, 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 um, Soledad Villar, who works a lot on, on um, invariant networks. Thank you. So, yeah, I know, I'm sorry, I'm throwing out like a bunch of names. If you send me an email later, I can, uh, I can sort of lay out the papers. Yeah, yeah, I would appreciate that, thank you. Yeah, happy to. Okay. Um, so if that's that, um, what I want to do is kind of move on a little bit, which is to talk about some recent work that I've been doing, which is actually trying to use the fact that we know low dimensional data can be modeled nicely. Um, so this actually was inspired by the previous talk, the previous uh, work. Give a talk about this at RPI late last year. My colleague Rangji Lai um, mentioned that he had these these networks that they were working on, and we kind of found some interesting fusion. And and uh, yeah, I'll kind of I'll just kind of jump into it here. Um, so I want to ask a very similar question, but now we're actually going to be focusing on the practical. We're going to be focusing on the the construction networks. We're going to be fo focusing on the optimization. Like, can you actually learn low dimensional data? Right. Um, so the question we're asking here is, is it possible to simultaneously learn manifold valued data and a function that lies on that data? Okay. So in practice, there's actually a lot of people that care about both of these problems, right? Learning a function is learning a function. That's, you know, any classifier regression network you've seen these. Trying to learn a model of manifold value data is basically what an autoencoder does. So if you've never seen an autoencoder, what it is, it's a neural network that takes large dimensional data, tries to encode it down to a low dimensional latent space, and then reconstruct the data. Okay. Now, by, by, by pushing it down to a low dimensional latent space, by definition, whatever you spit back out is low dimensional. There's no way around it, right? If you take low D data and apply a function to it, whatever the output is, is some complicated low dimensional structure. I don't even want to say surface, but structure. Uh, so what we're saying is, all right, can we learn autoencoders that are going to explicitly incorporate this manifold assumption along with learning functions that were on that data? And does this work better than just learning a function classifier directly? Um, and, and we have a couple of additional kind of goals here, which is I'm always interested in working with people that are sort of domain experts. They know their data, they know, you know, the problem they're working on. So whatever we're building, especially if you're trying to encode data into a latent space, it's gotta be interpretable, right? You can't just, you know, say, oh, look, there's your points in a low dimensional space. I don't know what they look like. <laughs> so one way to do that is to have very, very, very simple encoders, just like linear encoders, right? And similarly, I want to think about functions that maybe are behave quite nicely on this latent space, right? It's incorporating some additional structure into the problem. Um, yeah, and, and so basically, you know, like I said, the, the, the goal here is that we're going to want to learn maybe not a global characterization of all of the data that, you know, is perfect for everything and completely uninterpretable. But I want to learn patches of my data. You know, so if I feed in a data point, I can say, here's what the data looks like around that data point in some nice low dimensional visualization, low dimensional coordinates. Okay. Um, and, and kind of my goal is to say, well, theoretically, experimentally, this actually works, right? Um, so um, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of move forward a little bit, uh, but I want to kind of give an idea of how the backbone of this works. So a couple of years ago, Rongji and uh, Stefan, who was his grad student at the time, he's now a postdoc at uh, Davis, 
they wrote this really cool paper called Chart Autoencoders, where what they said was, you know, rather than trying to learn one latent space, one low dimensional set of coordinates that describes everything, like that's impossible. Let's try to learn several. Right? So you learn a part, you learn some low dimensional coordinate system for here, you learn some low dimensional coordinate system for here, for here, and you kind of align them by knowing that there's overlap. Okay. Um, and, you know, if you're familiar with manifold learning, this is like trying to learn, you know, some partition of unity on your manifold, and you're trying to learn what goes on on each partition. Um, and, 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 you know, this is your sort of standard uh, uh, neural network construction. I don't have a better way of describing this other than to say the following. Um, what we're doing is, what he's doing is basically saying, let's take some data from the ambient space and let's define this thing, simple function, just called a chart autoencoder. Basically, all it's saying is this point that goes to that auto, that goes to that chart, this point that goes to that chart, this point that goes to that chart. Once you're on each one of these charts, now you don't have one latent space. That's too much to ask for. It's too hard. Let's have a, a handful of latent spaces. And then on each one, you can do whatever you were going to do, you know, build a generative model, whatever, build a nice decoder, and then add them all back up because this encoder told you the partition of unity and spit out some output that is your, you know, reconstruction. Uh, and and this, this is actually how this is trained. And, uh, and then we, what we kind of talked about adding to this is, well, you know, all right, let's say there's some function, you can model it on these low dimensional surfaces. Well, now it explicitly only gets, you know, a few parameters. So obviously you're going to be learning some simple function. Then you spit out whatever the function is going to be, whatever your prediction is. Um, and, and this is the construction and, and, um, you know, the thing that's funny about it was they had this paper and it's very nice. And the, the theory that they can build says the number of encoders you need scales with the intrinsic dimension, but that's brutal. That says that like the number of latent spaces you need would be like 0.1 to the 10th, which is like completely undoable. But in practice, they actually only needed like five, 10, maybe like a very constant number that didn't depend on the intrinsic dimension. And it's a very weird question that we wanted to think about. And that was kind of what merged in these collaborations was how to approximate functions, how do we go beyond the dimensionality. Um, and, and what we got to was the following. So I don't want to think about having to have the number of charts be absolutely huge, even related to the intrinsic dimension. And also, I really want to think about very, very simple encoders, like linear encoders, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to think about breaking up our data into a few regions. Right, and then just build like a linear encoder for each region. And then a complicated decoder to do the reconstruction. How well will that work? So it requires, and I know I'm basically running out of time, so I'll go through this part pretty quick and just kind of show you some examples, but it requires us to be a little bit more lax about what we need from a latent space, from an encoder. Encoders, everyone's always trying to build them to be isometric. That's hard. I just, I just want them to be finite distortion. I want them to be one-to-one. -one. That's it. If I'm one-to-one, -one, I have a latent space where I can do something and build a decoder, right? So we relax to this notion of what we call finite distortion embedding, right? It's like a one-to-one -one embedding, right? Of some patch of a latent, of, of a manifold. Um, and, and, you know, it needs to be by Lipschitz, which means it's stable. Um, so... When we do this, it actually means we don't need that many latent spaces to encode complicated data. Um, so, for example, let's say you add a sphere, right? That's the simplest thing. And sphere could be in high dimensional space. Using, you know, patches and charts, you would need, you know, epsilon to the D, or epsilon to the minus D latent spaces. But if you just kind of relax to just saying, I need a, you know, finite distortion embedding, you really only need like two or three hyperplanes, project half the sphere onto this one, half the sphere onto this one. It's not the worst encoder in the world. And then you can build your complicated decoder to, to regenerate data. And so we, we proved this. It, it, the number of charts you need is completely in, you know, uh, completely divorced from the intrinsic dimension. It's just constant. And we proved this as a function of the reach. We proved this for certain non-C2 manifolds, you know, areas that have cusps and stuff. 
And we actually have this kind of fun conjecture that we're trying to prove if anyone is really interested in manifold learning and wants to think about like really interesting kind of geometric conjectures. Uh, I, I, I won't go into it here, but basically let me just say like, I'm pretty sure that this can be said for a general manifold and I have no idea how to say it. Uh, that the number of charts you need is really just kind of divorced from the dimensionality in most cases. Okay. Um, but, and by the way, what I should also say is that what we also showed is once you do this kind of really, really, really simple encoding, you put all the complexity on the decoder, it can be, it won't be that complicated and it can learn, you know, reconstructions of manifolds nicely. Okay. So I want to actually show an example of this. So there's two examples I'm going to focus on here. This is the first. Let's say my data is clustered and I want to build a generative model for it, right? So, um, you know, this is the training data, the cluster data. Using this chart autoencoder, what do we figure out? Well, we figure out, well, this could be represented by some two-dimensional chart. This could be some represented by some two-dimensional chart, this one. Each one of these will basically get assigned its own latent space. And by the way, I should say, this is trained from scratch. I, there's no, you know, like there's no trickery here. I, we just took a, this architecture, fed it in, spit it out. This was the generation generated data. Okay, so you can see that we actually do a pretty good job of, of matching the distribution of the input data. And what you get is basically a latent space for each one of these things. Um, this is a kind of famously hard problem for generative models. It winds up if you want to build your most complicated VAE, GAN, whatever you're thinking of, and you only have one latent space, you're always going to get these kind of points that just kind of blur in the middle. And you have to do all this complicated rejection sampling or like, you know, MCMC algorithms in order to figure out where to sample from. If you just relax your assumption and allow yourself to have multiple latent spaces, this comes quite naturally. Okay. And this is the really fun one. There's this famous data set called Co uh, Coil, uh, Coil 10, Coil 20, I forget. Uh, yeah. I think it's called Coil 20, but it's 10 images. I, I forget. But uh, basically what it is, is um, it's all of these objects and you just get pictures of them rotating, right? So, you know, we had these, you know, this rubber ducky and it was rotating and this, uh, you know, car and it's rotating. Um, and so you have these, like, it's like these circles in image space. So it's really hard to build a generative model for this. It's actually a notoriously hard problem. Um, what we did was we said, all right, let's, you know, relax our need to have one latent space. And what we can do, this is, by the way, reconstructed data. This is a sampling of our one-dimensional latent space, one of our one-dimensional latent spaces. And this is a sampling of another one of our low-dimensional latent spaces. So you see what it did. It, it split the it split the duck in half and said, all right, I'm going to model half the rotations over here and I'm going to model the other half of the rotations over here. Truly one dimensional. Okay. And then the decoder spends all of its time trying to build nice reconstructions. And you can see that these actually are pretty good reconstructions. You can tell that this is one of those little cats that's waving and this is, you know, a stick of butter and car, all these things. We, we have a very nice generative model that actually works here. And I should note that we had to do one additional thing, which was, again, we had 20 charts for 10 pieces of data. That's about the minimum amount you could need. We brought in a tiny amount of labeled information. So basically we assumed that 10% of those points, we knew the label for it. And doing that kind of just helps us figure out where to put these cuts. Once you know it, you build this really nice generative model, semi-supervised generative model. That uh, to me is really sort of the best way to approach manifold value data for, for generative modeling. Um, so yeah, um, that's, you know, some of this work, um, I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip the last thing. I'll just, if you're interested in statistics, it's basically about how neural networks can work on statistics problems. Um, so I'll go ahead and skip to the end. This is kind of a list of a few of the papers. I talked about this paper by, with me and Timo, intrinsic dimensionality, this paper, semi-supervised manifold learning with chart autoencoders. This is the one I just talked about. And then this kind of side paper that's by, uh, um, so Scott was on that paper. Scott's also, he was the lead author of this paper that was about the fact that if you fix the size of a neural network ahead of time, you have this non-closedness problem. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop here. Um, yeah. And let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks Alex.
Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Alex? You can either come off mute or type them in the chat if your microphone's not working. Do you have thoughts on how you would go about training in the in the space that you talked about in the first half of the talk where you can have like where you're looking at varying the size of the network as opposed to fixing the size of the network? It is, it is a little tricky. I I don't have a great way to talk about like this is how you build, you know, a variable size network. There are some people in CS that consider it within what's called the auto ML framework. They're basically thinking about the size of the network as being a hyperparameter. And so they allow the size of the network to vary. It is computationally very expensive. My moral of the story, I think, is just to not be hyper bound to the size of your network. And if you notice the if you notice that your weights are going crazy, make the network bigger. It's not that big of a deal, right? And and that basically weights blowing up is because you did not allow your network to grow in size. So it's more kind of a practitioner thing at the moment. I would love to figure out how to actually optimize over sizes of networks, but I don't know how to do that. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a question for you, Alex. You might have, might have covered this and I might have missed it, but uh, towards the first half of your talk, what, what if the noise direction isn't perpendicular to the lower dimensional subspace? What, what can I do? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, so. Ooh, that is, that's a really good question. Um, I would say, all right, so morally. What we're saying is like that the 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 noise being perpendicular was kind of the data generating process. But then when we're learning a network, we're not paying attention to the fact that the noise was perpendicular. We're just saying if your data lied off the manifold, project it back down. Right? So if your noise was in some anisotrop, like some non-normal direction, what that means is the projection would put you in the wrong place. Right? So it would be about how to incorporate that and and how to learn it. So if we wanted to incorporate that into this model, this kind of approximation model, let's say all of the noise was sort of, you know, angled in a similar way, right? You know, or varied in such a way that there wasn't like overlap of, of noise too, too much, you know, in the infinitesimal sense. Um, then I think that all of the theory would sort of still follow through. But, uh, and basically you would have to replace learning the projection operator with learning this tilted projection operator that was kind of not normal. Okay, that makes sense. But it sounds yeah. kind of maybe ho hopeless if, I, if, if it's a random direction of noise. Yeah, if it's a random direction, the problem is basically collisions, right? So if it's a random direction everywhere, then all of a sudden, like the moment you move off manifold, you have two points from a very different part of the manifold that end up in the exact same place. And so you've kind of broken your kind of one to oneness. Like, how could you learn a function at that point when it can't be modeled by a function because it could have been projected into either place on the manifold? Yeah. Okay. I'm following you. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how to do that in practice, by the way? Ooh, I have no idea. That would be hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, we might have uh, time for one last question if if there's another question. All right, well, Alex, um, thank you so much for taking time today to tell us about your really interesting work. And, and again, Alex expressed it at the beginning of the talk, but if you're interested in talking more with him about any of these ideas, I know Alex is interested in sharpening connections here with us at LLNL, so, so please um, reach out to him or I can connect you if you reach out to me. Um, lastly, I just wanted to advertise that next month we're going to have our first hybrid seminar in quite some time since before the pandemic. So if you're if you're on site and able to join us in person next month, um, I, ho I hope you will. And uh, thanks everybody for joining today. And thanks again, Alex. Yeah, thank you guys so much. And by the way, I'll, let me just say, uh, as, as Sarah was saying, I, I'm super interested in talking more about interesting problems that people are working on because I always feel like it motivates new math. But I also want to. I just kind of want to emphasize, like, this is a very mathy talk. I'm, you know, uh, I also like working on applied, like, truly applied problems. Like, there's some other work that I do, you know, with econ economists and medical people and stuff like that. So, I, I, you know, 
I'd love to, you know, get down in the weeds of data and stuff if that's of interest. But yeah, if you're if this seems interesting and relevant, please, please reach out. Thanks, Alex. Bye, yeah. everybody. Thank you.